Welcome to the library. You know, um, one of the things that I always love about libraries is that to me, libraries are places where accidental learning happens. So sometimes it's that book you didn't know existed that happened to be on the shelf, and sometimes it's walking into the library and there's a whole jazz band set up, right? So um, that's what we're kind of about here. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming and thank uh, the musicians, and um, I especially want to make some quick thank yous. Um, this is part of our One Book, One College series. Uh, this year we're looking at Tony, our, uh, Tony Horowitz's Confederates in the Attic, which you may think this is quite a stretch, but we're looking at the large history of what happened at the Civil War and how music, culture, um, people came together and pushed that forward, and definitely um, jazz is born um, out of that history. I want to thank uh, Dean Wally Franzak, thank the music department, and also thank um, Dean Jane Long, who uh, all of whom helped to make this happen. And the main person who made this happen is Doug Brat. So thank you, Doug, who is the coordinator for uh, the jazz ensemble. Yes. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Doug, and thank you all again. Thanks so much, Troy. Uh, we're going to introduce the musicians and talk a little bit about what we're going to do, but we want to play first. So we're going to start off with a tune uh, from the late 1950s by Miles Davis, and this is a tune called Milestones.
Thank you so much. Let me back up here just a little bit. Uh, now, jazz, for those of you that, well, let me ask this first. How many of you have ever seen a live jazz group before that's of a collegiate or professional level? And nothing against high school groups because I love them. I work with them all the time. Okay. So when you see jazz and you hear something that you like, what do you do? I like that. That was good. What do you do is you shout out. You go, yeah, that's right. All right, play that. All right, clap a little bit. All right, we like that. The energy that you guys give back feeds the energy that you feel up here, okay? So if you hear a solo that you like or even a moment during a solo that you like, clap out. It's, this is a participatory uh, art form here. It's not one of those that we just sit there and plunk your head into the cake. But it's just a lovely solo. Oh, it's so nice. Did you hear the tessitura? Um, anyway, let me do a quick introduction here. We're going to try to talk less and play more. The goal of today is, and I've got some, I know I have some introduction to American music students here uh, 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 checking this out, and I have some other folks in, which is wonderful. But we're going to take you on a little musical journey uh, and try to tie into what Troy began uh, to speak about at the very top here, uh, which is how through the great migration and the development of African American song styles from the folk music and blues of the South uh, spread throughout the United States and fed into what became styles like ragtime, jazz, big band swing, and later developments, which, believe it or not, we wouldn't have hip hop or R&B or rock and roll were it not for any of that effort from those wonderful artists that came you know, in the late 1800s and early part of the 1900s. So uh, we have a great band here uh, uh, made up of some faculty members from the college here in the teaching the music department, as well as some friends of ours. But let me just kind of go down uh, and introduce everybody. Uh, those of you that are in uh, Intro to American Music at 12.30, Tuesdays and Thursdays probably know, but this is Ms. Mai Sujimoto, who teaches alto sax and Intro to American and a bunch of stuff here. <laughs> Next to Mai, a wonderful trumpet player, uh, originally from North Carolina, right? Uh, by way of uh, Cincinnati Conservatory of Music by way of Chicago, Illinois. Plays all around town in some amazing groups, uh, including his own group, the Nia Quintet, which just played last night at Qu Quenchers? Jerry's. Jerry's Sandwich Shop. They've got great sandwiches and jazz. Can you beat that? I don't think so. But anyway, how about a big hand for Scott Anderson on the trumpet and flugelhorn? Another wonderful musician, uh, a longtime friend of mine now, a uh, great writer and arranger and trombone player, uh, uh, tours with various groups, plays all throughout the Chicago area. Uh, both Scott and uh, uh, Raphael play in a great group um, called the Model Citizens Jazz Orchestra. Is it Jazz Orchestra? Is that or Big band, sorry, sorry. Uh, which if you're ever down at the Gallery Cabaret, you should check them out on a Monday night. Is it what's the last Monday of the month or something like that? Third. Uh, I'm, I'm failing up here miserably now. But anyway, check out Model Citizens and uh, give a big hand to Raphael Crawford there on the trombone. <laughs> Another outstanding faculty member here at Moraine Valley uh, directs the Jazz Combo, teaches music appreciation, intro to American music, and teaches uh, a gazillion guitar students every semester. Uh, wonderful player uh, and man about town. How about a big hand for Mr. Tim Burns down there on the guitar? <laughs> And then uh, back on the piano there, another faculty member from uh, the music department here at Moraine, uh, wonderful piano player, also a wonderful trombone player, but we've got him on his, uh, in his piano hat today. Where's your hat, Kevin? Anyway, uh, he's a, 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 a great uh, colleague and friend for a long time. Big hand for Kevin Fort back down on the piano. And last but certainly not least, uh, uh, Patrick and I have known each other since the, the late 90s, uh, I guess, yeah, which is getting to be a long time now. Shocking, I know, 90s. Uh, but uh, from the Quad Cities area originally, uh, just got off the road with Under the Street Lamp, which is the spin-off show, if you will, from the Jersey Boys uh, cast. It features all of them, and he's been their music director and road manager and on tour with them for a while. But how about a big hand for Mr. Patrick Williams back there on bass? All right, so as I said, we're going to take a little musical journey, uh, give you some examples of some different things. Does anybody know uh, any of the styles that sort of preceded jazz that you've maybe learned in your classes at all? Can anybody name something? <clears throat> right? These are participation points coming your way. Yes, sir, in the back. Ragtime, absolutely. And ragtime, for those of you that aren't terribly familiar with it, uh, we'll give you an example of it. Kevin is going to play just a little bit. 
Uh, from This is not maple leaf rag, so ignore that. We, we miscoordinated. But it's by the same composer, Mr. Scott Joplin, who wrote over uh, 50 uh, sort of iconic ragtime pieces. And uh, Kevin's going to play just a little bit of, of a tune. See if you can recognize the title just from listening to it. Kevin, take it away. time is that uh, Scott Joplin and others who were writing at the same time were hearing some of the folkloric African-American improvisatory music and kind of trying to encapsulate that and write it down uh, and make it a, a maybe, if you will, and I'll use this term in air quotations, sorry for that, those of you that that bothers, uh, try to legitimize these improvisations a little bit, which didn't really need to be done, but they didn't have a way to capture them other than the written art form at that point. There was no recording technology, there was no MP3s, there was no record players even. So the only way to grab these improvisations and show them to folks that weren't there to experience them live was to write them down. And so part of that effort uh, was ragtime music and the, the syncopated or sort of off-kilter, if you will, rhythm of ragtime is one of those rhythms that the syncopation of which fed early jazz. Uh, if you watched Kevin's left hand, it has something of a stride-like uh, bass line. He's basically playing melody and accompanying himself as a bass player would. Now what early jazz musicians decided to do is that as they got together in groups to play in places like where? Where would, New where would we have heard jazz? What cities and what, what areas of the country in the early days of it? Chicago, New York, where else? New Orleans, for sure, absolutely. And while it's arguable that jazz started in New Orleans exclusively, it did not. It was coming up in many different cities. That was one of the nexus points for it. So we'll kind of talk about it from that perspective. Uh, and in New Orleans, you would have heard musicians playing Dixieland music and ragtime and improvising in a live context. And one of the coolest things about jazz, most interesting, and the thing that we're trying to do up here each and every time we play, is to make art happen right at the very moment that you're witnessing it. Imagine being able to watch a sculptor sculpt, a painter paint, you know, a novelist write. That might be kind of boring, actually, but, uh, but and nothing against novelists, but it's, it's art happening right in front of your eyes, basically. And that's what we're, we're going for, and that's what the early musicians were essentially doing. So they may have played something like this next piece that we're going to do. Uh, and this is an old ragtime piece called High Society. I'm sorry. We're going to do St. Louis Blues first before we get into that. The other style <laughs> is that would fi had fed the early jazz is the blues. Um, so what, what we'll see with this here is a style, a genre that is also coming up alongside of ragtime, and they're going to coalesce together into, into terms of early jazz. Now, in blues, we have a, a 12 um, bar form, typically. All right, and we also have something called a blues scale. Could one of you horn players maybe play a little blues scale for me? Any key. And it has this flat fifth and flat seventh uh, uh, scale degree that makes it have sort of a mournful or soulful quality to it. That's part of the blues. The blues is also an AABA. Uh, stanza form that you guys are going to learn about in uh, your 106 class if you haven't already. Have you guys covered that already? Yeah, good. Okay, good. So, uh, and we're going to demonstrate a classic blues. Now, this is the style of blues. This was less of the uh, uh, um, Robert Johnson gritty sort of roadhouse blues. This would be the more commercial blues that you would have seen uh, in the black theater uh, touring groups at the time, which are sort of equivalent to vaudeville. They'd have all sorts of entertainment, but one of the live entertainment uh, types was singing. And, and, and blues and whatnot. And one of the great blues singers of all times is this woman back here uh, on the screen, Ms. Bessie Smith. And uh, we're going to play one of her tunes, Sans Vocalist, that was written by W.C. Handy, uh, another uh, wonderful African-American composer who was very taken by the blues and sought to write it down uh, and bring that forward. And they collaborated together on this one. And we're going to play a little bit of that for you guys right now. Thank you. 
So as we were talking about before, you can hear that mournful quality in that in that song. It's usually played very slowly. Uh, there's a, there's some twists in the lyrics, uh, and you have to kind of read through the poetry of that to understand that this woman uh, has has lost her lover uh, to some other rich woman, and she's very bitter about it. But at the very end, she's kind of like, yeah, I don't need that guy after all. You know, I'm moving on. I've got me. And so there's a certain sort of commiserating that you can do, and then also at the end of it, feel sort of uplifted that she has kind of overcome these challenges and hurdles and whatnot. So, uh, all right, so as I was leading to uh, badly before here, uh, but now would like to, to join up with, we've got an example of how these are starting to come together, both the blues and the ragtime in early New Orleans jazz. Now, who would be an artist that you would think of when you think of early New Orleans jazz music? Yes, Louis Armstrong, absolutely. And he played what instrument, do you remember? Not bass. Cornet or trumpet, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, and as a matter of fact, with this particular song, this was a, you know, with a, when it was recorded, it featured a young Louis Armstrong uh, who was performing with what at the time was the top New Orleans jazz group, which had actually migrated, if you will, or moved itself to the Chicago area. And they used to play down at the Savoy Ballroom in Chicago. And it was led by a wonderful cornetist or trumpet player by the name of Joe King Oliver. And they had a wonderful group. And usually you didn't see bands with two trumpet players at that time. But they would have these wonderful fiery exchanges in terms of solos and whatnot. But a song that they may have played uh, and did record during those uh, performances here in Chicago by all New Orleans musicians that just had transplanted themselves up here uh, they would play a tune like this one called High Society. So we're going to check this out here. It's got a sort of a ragtime, Dixieland, blues feel, uh, and uh, we've got something of an arrangement here, so we'll, we'll play through this for you.
So that was an example of what you might have heard at a speakeasy or a saloon or some sort of club in New Orleans in the 1920s uh, in early 1930s. Uh, again, that was by, uh, 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 as if it had been performed by Joe King Oliver and whatnot. Now, we're not what we would call a repertoire band. In other words, we don't have authentic instrumentation. We have modern jazz instrumentation, so we're adapting a little bit to that uh, and doing our own versions of each of these, but just so you guys can get a little sample of them. Now, as uh, jazz starts to spread around the country, initially it's a sort of a localized phenomenon, but it quickly becomes the equivalent of today's modern pop music. So, if you will, the Rihanna of the 1930s might have been Benny Goodman. Yeah, that might be a stretch. But uh, just in terms of popularity, let's at least think about it uh, uh, equivalent to that in terms of the superstardom. And we have a couple of uh, uh, trends going on. One is just a, a, a love of dancing. There's all these different dance moves that are coming about at this point. Uh, the Charleston, the Lindy Hop, and the swing dancing craze kicks off. And with dancing, you need more space, you need bigger venues, and you need, consequently, larger groups. So we give rise in jazz to something called the big band. We have a big band here at Moraine. Uh, most, uh, you'd be most likely to see a big band either in downtown Chicago or at a college or high school or, or something along those lines these days. Uh, but back in the 30s and the 40s, that was the popular you know, form, that was the way that most people went out to see music. They would expect to see a big band, they would expect to go dancing, and everybody knew how to dance. That was something you took classes in, and it was really fun to do, and it was, that was your social entertainment. There was no Facebook, I hate to say it. Big band book, that's what you had instead. And one of the leaders uh, in that creating this national phenomenon was a clarinetist born in Chicago uh, named Benny Goodman. He later relocated to New York City, uh, but he led one of the most successful and most popular big bands of all time. Uh, and uh, his orchestra is known for Sing, 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 which you've ever seen the Jim Carrey movie, The Mask, you would have heard that in there, and a lot of the Oreo cookie commercial, my students always tell me they hear that in there. Uh, Chips Ahoy, sorry, wrong cookie. Still delicious, though. Anyway, um, but uh, so yeah, and, and what we're going to do for you is a, uh, uh, an, an excerpt, uh, if you will, or uh, of a tune that was one of his biggest hits, uh, most famously recorded on a Carnegie Hall concert in 1938. Now, what style of music, those of you that are familiar with Carnegie Hall in New York, do you most associate Carnegie Hall with? Classical music. What do you guys think the audiences at Carnegie Hall thought when jazz came to Carnegie Hall for the first time in 1938. It was kind of shocking. Some people were not very happy about it, but it was a wildly successful concert. They recorded it, later released it. They didn't plan to release it initially. The recording quality is pretty scratchy, but it's an amazing live recording of the band playing basically for the first time in this, this esteemed classical venue. And if nothing else, B Benny's music and his efforts really helped catapult jazz into the public's eye and that they became aware of it for the first time and they established it as a legitimate music style by bringing it to places like Carnegie Hall and then of course turning around the country. So we're going to do, uh, uh, this is from 1938, Stomping at the Savoy.
could you guys imagine yourself slow dancing at the Savoy Ballroom with that? Um, one thing I want to mention too, you guys can ask questions anytime. You got, if you want to know, you know, what, 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 were you, what, what were you doing or how are you doing that? This is, you know, participatory. We're here to talk about what we're, what we're doing and so you guys get an appreciation for it. Yeah. And if you hear, um, those of you that have seen the old, it's now old, Peanuts cartoons, you know, and the, and the grown-ups, they all, they're all, wah, wah, wah. that's trombone with pixie mute, and then do you have your plunger with you by any chance? They say the, the trombone, and, and uh, I you know believe this to be true, is, is really the closest instrument to what the human voice can do just in terms of inflection and and color and whatnot so yeah it's a pretty amazing instrument really <laughs> all right so any other questions at all that you guys can think of along the way here so far we're gonna we're gonna talk about another amazing oh tim go ahead oh Everybody, we're talking about gear, clarinet gear. Everybody's like, <laughs> oh, <we're sorry. laughs> I will not tell you what kind of drumsticks I'm using. Don't ask that question. Um, I don't even know. I just grabbed them out of the bag. The, uh, we're going to talk about another wonderful uh, big band leader, actually two more here from the 30s and 40s. Uh, this gentleman here is truly one of the great uh, American composers of any genre or style. Uh, wrote over 2,000 compositions total in his lifetime, including uh, an unfinished opera, symphonic works, uh, short three-minute jazz, mood pieces, and whatnot. Uh, just an amazing, amazing composer and player. Uh, pianist, uh, if you guys didn't know that, I guess I'll put that up there. But he led one of the most successful and enduring big bands uh, for over 50 years, uh, the Duke Ellington Orchestra. And uh, we're going to play a selection of Dukes called In a Sentimental Mood.
again for Raphael Crawford on trombone. Tim Burns over there on guitar. Check. So one of the other icons of the swing era was a gentleman originally from New Jersey, Red Bank to be specific, but later made his way through playing with some theatrical groups and vaudeville groups out into the central part of the United States to Kansas City, which besides being famous for delicious barbecue, is also famous for jazz. And what he did is assembled a group of musicians uh, and uh, they would play what was known as riff, R-I-F-F, -F, riff style jazz, uh, big band jazz, where they would basically make up the arrangements and the charts on the bandstand. They played very little from written music, which was unusual for a large band of 15 to 18 musicians. Uh, that was the Count Basie Orchestra, led by the great Count Basie. And uh, as this style took off, you'll notice that it's, again, very bluesy influenced, uh, and what they would use is blues ideas and riffs and whatnot, although this isn't truly a blues, but it has qualities of that in there. Uh, we're going to do a tune by the Count Basie Orchestra that would be a great swing dance tune from the 30s and uh, uh, written by Lester Young, uh, who was an outstanding tenor saxophonist for the group, uh, also called Prez, P-R-E-Z, he had a nickname. He actually used to nickname everybody in the band. Uh, so he was a kind of a the iconic jazz musician, if you will, when you looked at, at his pictures and whatnot. That's Prez up there with the tenor sax and then Count Basie. Uh, this is from 1939. It's a riff style. It's got kind of a repeated little riff that we're going to hear again and again. Could we hear just a, a little bit of that riff from the horns here so that they can kind of hone in on it? One, uh, 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 uh. Right, exactly. And they probably made that up on the bandstand one night. They needed another tune, and they said, all right, well, let's just do this rhythm changes thing. And they knew the chord changes, and they just made it up. Yeah, question. That's a great question. The, 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 her question was, what's the difference between collective improvisation and riff style? Well, in essence, it's an outgrowth of it, but collective tended to be more chaotic to the listener's ear in that everybody would be improvising perhaps different melodies that would hopefully relate to each other at the same time, uh, add up to a greater whole. I always tell my class it's akin to sitting in a crowded room and listening to you know, 50 different conversations around you at the same time between you know, different people. Whereas riff style was made up to be played as a unison thing, where the trumpet player, maybe S Scott, would say to Raphael, hey, check this part out. And Raphael would just hear it and pick up on it and go, and would join in at the same time and try to line all that up together, rather than it being sort of disparate, separate melodies at the same time. It's a great question, and it's, it's a confusing point to a certain extent when you start to look at that stuff. Another thing you should know, too, just in general, even today, right here in front of you, we have, for what we're looking at, is a single sheet of paper that has some words on it and notes, just a single line, the melody. That's all we have. And it actually, if we played to the end of the page, it would be a very short tune of about probably, you know, 25 seconds long or something like that. So all we do is we start with that, and the eight of us just go, all right, and we have a sort of a common vocabulary and a framework with which we're used to dealing with each other. And we just go. This uh, this group, by the way, although I've personally played with everybody here uh, on a number of occasions, I think I'm the only one that has, as a group, this is it. This is our world premiere performance. Thank you very much. <laughs> but that's that's a really common thing with jazz. Very often, you know, you arrive, you know, you can go to a club in Milwaukee in the middle of the night and say, hey, let's uh, see some jazz musicians up on the stage, get your horn out and go and say, hey, let's play some blues and you can go play for a real long time doing that. So we're going to do a little bit of this Lester Leaps In uh, by the Count Basie Orchestra for you. Uh, who's soloing on this one? The other thing, too, listen for, this has a bridge or a, a sort of change of key, a little transitory material. It's completely improvised. It's not written on the page. Every time we play through it, it'll be different. 
and you're going to hear but if that first melody that you heard twice, an improvised bridge, then you'll hear the melody again on the way out. It's a very kind of structured, but there's some free exploration that gets to go on in the middle. And that's the way it was written, to have that open bridge section where the instrumentalist is just improvised. It's kind of an unusual chart in that way, at least for us these days, not for the time. Here we go. One, two, one, two. <laughs> Did you see what, uh, I don't know if you caught that on the improvised bridge. Scott played it the first time, but then when we played it on the, uh, the way out, what did he do? Did anybody catch what he did? No, he turned and threw it, he threw it, like past the ball, if you will, you know, to over, over to Kevin, kind of gave him a little nod, and Kevin was like, all right, I'm on it. You know, and that's one of the things that just happens on the fly. It feels right, felt good, everybody was on the same page. That's part of the, 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 the beauty of this music, is that it changes in the moment. And that's exciting. Yes. Uh, it, that's a great question. She asked, how does the communication happen? Does anybody, do you want to, uh, Rafael? Yeah. Yeah.
yeah, and sometimes it's, we don't, you know, there's not a lot of pre-planning, a little bit, some, but we, we, when we're up here, it's like a lot of times that's like somebody takes the lead, and that can be, you know, sometimes that can be bad. You can get with somebody that just like tr basically kind of steals the whole conversation. That's not a lot of fun, actually. Uh, or sometimes you'll get uh, with players that are lack the confidence to assert themselves where they need to, and that's also can be uncomfortable. But when you get great musicians like this, everybody's on the same page and they're responding and listening. A lot of it is just about having your ears open when you're doing it. So, uh, and then it's visual sometimes, body language, things like that, you know. Uh, may, but a lot of times it comes from what's something the instrument plays itself, and that we all cue in on that. So, good, good question. Any other questions about that? Great. Let's keep moving. I want to uh, move into the 1950s solidly here. Uh, Mai, would you be willing to talk a little bit about bebop at all? Or I, I was throwing this to you. Why don't I? Yeah, okay, <laughs> fair enough. All right, all right. So we're talking about bebop. You guys heard of that style of jazz before? And uh, there's a lot I could talk about that, but suffice to say that the big bands were starting to ebb slightly at this point, ever so slightly. Um, and this is post-World War II, and one of the moves that jazz musicians is sort of internally as a community start to do is they have these late night jam sessions. Uh, places like uh, Mitten's Playhouse, and I'm trying to think of some of the other places uh, uh, in that time frame. That was a big one, though. Yeah, that's where most of the recordings are from. They would gather, I'm spacing on the rest of the, there's a, a series of club houses, clubs in New York where they would go and play small cramped quarters, not enough room for dancing. In fact, dancing was outlawed or against ordinances, I should say, uh, in many of these clubs. And so what they would do is experiment with increasing the tempo, increasing the rhythmic complexity, increasing the harmonic complexity, and challenging other musicians to keep up with them. It was almost sort of like a dare. I bet you can't play this fast. I bet you can't play this rhythm. I bet you don't know what harmonies I'm playing. And that was an interesting thing for musicians and listeners alike, and some people loved it, and, and some people went crazy for it. Uh, for the dancers, though, a lot of times it wasn't their cup of tea because the melodies were angular and hard to follow sometimes. Sometimes. I'm generalizing here. Um, and it, they were not necessarily the easiest tempos sometimes to dance to as well. So there were some, there were some things running against bebop. Many historians will say bebop is where jazz starts to lose, if you will, sort of its pre presence in the United States in terms of its being the, the top, you know, most popular genre of music. It's a little bit arguable. I think Elvis and the Beatles probably had more to do with that than anything else, um, you know, and nothing against them because they're wonderful musicians as well. But when rock and roll came in, that had more to do with separating jazz from public consciousness. So we're going to play a tune by... The great Charlie Parker, considered to be one of the most influential saxophonists of all times. Uh, and it's a, a tune called Blues for Al Alice, uh, written in 1951. Uh, and we're going to feature Mai and Tim and, is that it on this one? I, I think so, just Mai and Tim. And, I, uh, and listen for how sort of angular this is. It is a blues, but it's not your conventional blues. This is not Bessie Smith, okay?
<laughs> it is. It is. Too many notes. And you see how much denser, how much busier that style is? It's great. I mean, it's really interesting. There's a lot to focus on, uh, but it, it, it has a, a lot of activity built into it. Now, as something of a reaction to it, and just something as another trend in music that's going on at the time, comes another style in the 50s called cool jazz. Let me pull that slide up for you here. And as sort of a reaction to that, uh, musicians decided that the density wasn't quite to their liking and the speed wasn't quite to their liking, and they wanted to explore harmony and openness a little more fully. And so one of the leaders in this new style called cool jazz, who encompassed a lot of different musicians, was a great baritone saxophone player by the name of Jerry Mulligan. And Mulligan uh, recorded a number of albums with what we would call a piano -less or quartet. In other words, there was no harmony instrument over there. So there's nobody playing chords, uh, nobody outlining the harmony other than the bassist uh, in the group at the time. So it demanded a little bit more of the musicians, but it also demanded uh, or allowed for a, a more breathing room, if you will, harmonically in the music. So we're going to, in honor of the month of February, uh, play a great uh, Jerry Mulligan arrangement uh, in our own sort of way, without piano, without guitar, without drums even, uh, My Funny Valentine.
Pat Anderson on trumpet, everybody. How about it? Yeah. <laughs> Raphael Crawford, Patrick Williams. We're gonna we're gonna skip ahead just a little bit here in the interest of time because I know some of you have a class uh, that you'll need to get to at uh, the two o'clock hour here. Um, what I want to do is we're gonna kind of move towards let's do four on six because and, and we'll uh, con conclude with that. D could you guys tell how much more spacious in terms of the sound that you get with the cool jazz? It's much mellower. It's much more open. You know, uh, some of the famous recordings are like Miles Davis's "My Funny Valentine." Uh, is a great album to get. You know, there's all sorts of uh, um, sketches of uh, Spain is another one as well. So you can look into some of those albums as well. Uh, very spacious. It's almost, almost romantic to a certain extent, a lot of people will say. Great date albums if you're looking for something to listen to, right? Okay. Cool. Check this out, Miles Davis. <laughs> anyway. Um, one of the other trends that we see as well is a return to the blues. Uh, during the 1950s and early 1960s and because it never really goes away blues is the language sort of the lingua franca of jazz if you will and it, it's an undercurrent a thread through everything that we do uh, and, and all the styles it obviously feeds into rock and roll later on but there was a movement as well in jazz alongside bebop and cool jazz called hard bop or funky jazz and it's not funk sort of like cool in the gang funk uh, or earth wind and fire funk it's a little Exactly, exactly. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a funkiness, an earthy quality. Uh, it's very gospel-influenced, very, very blues-infused, and more danceable to a certain extent, although it wasn't necessarily danced to a whole lot. But it's an exciting style. Uh, also, uh, from my own standpoint, interesting, because a lot of the great hard bop band leaders happen to be drummers. Art Blakey, Max Roach, folks like that, uh, uh, who were sort of idols of mine as I started to dig into jazz and listen a little bit more. So we're going to conclude this afternoon uh, and you're welcome to come up and ask us any questions or anything after. We'd be happy to talk to you guys about what it is we do, where you can see some of us play in the near future. These guys uh, and gals up here are very busy folks uh, playing out on the weekends and weeknights and whatnot all around Chicago. Um, but we're going to conclude with four on six. Actually, before we do that, I do want to say a couple of thank yous uh, to all the folks that put this together. Uh, for one, how about a big round of applause for Mr. Troy Swanson, uh, Department Chair for the Library, for bringing us out. We really appreciate that. And certainly, uh, you know, for the financial support to make this possible from the library as well as from the Liberal Arts Department, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, I want you to thank my musicians up here, my Sugamoto, Scott Anderson, Raphael Crawford, Tim Burns, Kevin Fort, Patrick Williams. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> you gotta look at my Chi Chi back here. Uh, don't forget to read Confederates in the Attic. It's a, it's a very interesting book to say the least. Uh, seeing how you can tie some jazz in with that. And then we wanna thank you with some gratitude. Uh, now that you know all about jazz, go out there, listen to some jazz, share your love, okay? That's important, that's really important. So we're gonna wrap things up here with a great hard bop classic from Wes Montgomery. A wonderful jazz guitar player. This is called Four on Six.
Thank you again. Once again, Tim Burns on guitar. <laughs> Raphael Crawford on the trombone. Scott Anderson on the trumpet. Mai Sugimoto on the alto sax and clarinet. Patrick Williams on the bass. And Kevin Ford on the keyboard. I'm Doug Bratt. Come and see some music over at the Fine and Performing Arts Center. I'd love to see you over there. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.